Welcome to the Thursday Reformed Fellowship. We are a ministry of First Presbyterian Church located on the corner of Fifth and Race Streets in Perkesey, Pennsylvania. Our uh, Reformed Fellowship meets at the A&N Diner in Sellersville, Pennsylvania at 8 o'clock every Thursday morning. Uh, we had a little bit of an interruption in our studies as uh, last week while I was on my way to the uh, diner, I had a little bit of a motorcycle accident. Um, I'm doing fine. My foot is healing. Um, it was just my foot that got caught underneath the bike. So uh, it's fine. It's healing. Nothing was broken, thankfully. Uh, but uh, anyway, that meant a bit of a delay in our recordings and in our work here. And the previous week, uh, I believe, was a week for presbytery meetings. And I had all kinds of things to do in preparation for that. So today I'm going to try to get caught up a little bit, uh, pulling together two topics which I think can be dealt with in a relatively brief period of time, uh, both of significant value for the church, uh, one more of a pastoral value, I think, uh, where it ministers to the needs of the hearts of God's people, um, and then the second uh, topic will be um, more theologically oriented, and uh, it's a very general, uh, broad brush uh, approach to um, the history of Christian theology, uh, the history of the Christian faith. So um, I'll make some general comments about that as we go along as well. So the two topics that we'll consider today are first uh, the um, unforgivable sin. Uh, that is to say that there is a sin which Jesus himself identifies that God will not forgive you of if you were to commit this sin. That is a very ominous sounding uh, description and we'll talk about that in a moment. The second uh, topic that we'll consider uh, Lord willing uh, today is the topic of syncretism. Uh, syncretism, that's the uh, blending of two religious belief systems, two uh, core ideas together, and trying to form some sort of synthesis um, through the merger of these two different belief systems. That's syncretism, and we'll talk about that for a little bit as well as it relates to Christian faith and theology. And so first, the the more pastoral concern uh, at the moment, uh, it's a question of theology to uh, uh, an extent as well, of course, but um, the topic of the unforgivable sin uh, is a topic which sometimes uh, troubles uh, Christians as to whether they have been guilty of committing such a sin. And uh, we, we sometimes get to be very anxious about that sort of thing and sometimes have some very um, uh, sobering thoughts about our destiny. So um, what is the unforgivable sin? Uh, how do we understand that sin? And then, you know, then we can begin to consider whether in fact we are guilty of that sin. Uh, as Dr. Sproul mentions in his book on the essential truths of the Christian faith, uh, Probably, if you are concerned about whether you have uh, committed the unpardonable sin, the unforgivable sin, uh, it's likely that you did not because the individual who might have committed such a sin probably is not very tender in their conscience about their relationship with God. Uh, so, uh, the topic of the unforgivable sin comes up in the gospel accounts where Jesus is uh, conducting a healing ministry. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus heals someone who is uh, blind and deaf, I believe is the particular uh, complexion of his uh, malady. And Jesus comes and heals the man, uh, much to the amazement of uh, those who observe it and witness it. And this included friends and enemies of Jesus. And with regard to the enemies of Jesus, you had the Pharisees and others, uh, Jewish religious leaders, um, 
very upset with Jesus, uh, trying to find some reason to accuse him. And uh, so they were in rather desperate uh, straits here. And so they latch on to this idea that the power by which Jesus cast out demons was not the power of God, but the power of the devil. And they went on to say that it was by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of the demons, that Jesus cast out demons. And so Beelzebub was uh, another name for Satan in short. And uh, I believe that it means Lord of the Flies. I'll need to look at that more closely at another time. But in any case, um, they were accusing uh, Jesus of making use of the power of the devil to accomplish his miraculous works. Now, uh, we always need to be very careful about what we say with regard to others and their ministries and what they are doing and be very, very careful not to um, uh, impugn an evil source for that which is truly good. So we need to guard our hearts. Jesus here uh, reasons with these Pharisees and with those who were in the audience there uh, listening to this. And uh, he, he works from their premise that it was by the power of the devil that he performed his miracles. And he just goes through a reasoning process to show that their proposition was irrational. Uh, it was futile. And indeed, it worked against them. Uh, it was irrational in the sense that um, uh, how can Satan cast out Satan if Satan is going to be victorious in his war against God and his kingdom? How can he do that which is contrary to his own interests? His kingdom will fall apart uh, by being uh, in conflict with itself like this. So um, there, there is a rational reason to reject that proposition that Jesus was empowered by Satan to do that which was a good thing, driving out demons and setting someone free from the power of demons. So, so Jesus reasons with the Pharisees with regard to the uh, claim that they made uh, and showed that uh, from just a human perspective in view of ways in which we ordinarily think it is surely uh, unreasonable to think that Jesus, by the power of Satan, drove out the demons. And so that was the fundamental confusion that Jesus addressed there. But then moving on, he goes into more of a theological uh, discussion. And here, it's a bit surprising, uh, to be honest, to, to see what Jesus goes on to say next, um, as he elevates this discussion uh, from merely assigning guilt, if you will, assigning responsibility for who casts out, or by what power these demons are being cast out. Um, Jesus then goes to uh, the, the level of uh, one's relationship to God. And so, um, of course, all of these things... Uh, have ramifications for our relationship with God. And uh, when we begin to uh, think about the ministry of Jesus, uh, there's always a question as to how you evaluate that ministry, and that reflects on your relationship to God. And so uh, Jesus then begins to uh, make some uh, broader points with regard to being a disciple and uh, united to him as opposed to one who is opposed to him. But then more deeply and profoundly he speaks about uh, the nature of sin and the aggravating circumstances of sin, if you will. And uh, here are the very severe um, consequences for one particular sin. And so Jesus says, you know, if you if you blaspheme against God, if you blaspheme against me, my name, that can be forgiven. And indeed, um, at the cross of Christ, there were many uh, uh, insults hurl hurled at Jesus, uh, many uh, proud uh, 
claims made against him, uh, these all can be forgiven. And in fact, Jesus said or prayed uh, that God would forgive the soldiers who were involved in the crucifixion because they didn't know what they were doing. They were just following their orders. And so Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So here is uh, direct hostility towards Jesus in putting him to death. Uh, and yet that was a forgivable sin. I don't know what the specific uh, decision of the Lord was with regard to those soldiers, but presumably if he prayed for their forgiveness, they would have been forgiven at some point. We, uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, but not all of Jesus' prayers were answered in the affirmative, as we know that his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, uh, did not receive an affirmative answer. Uh, remember he asked that, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. In other words, it, it, if it be possible, let's find a way where I don't have to be crucified to pay for the sins of God's people. But uh, there was no other way. Uh, and Jesus then said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Uh, so he, he submitted himself to the will of God there. So, sins against the Son can be forgiven even up to and including crucifying the Son of God on the cross. Um, but Jesus says a sin against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven, not in this age nor in the age to come. Now that is a very fearful thing. And Jesus in uh, raising this issue, I think, uh, highlights the unique work of the Holy Spirit and the unique uh, danger that comes to those who uh, uh, oppose that work. The Father speaks to us his word in command form and we are responsible to obey him. Jesus comes and lays down his life for us. He calls us to repentance and faith and we are responsible to obey him. If we fail and we fail, we can yet be forgiven. But when we reject the Holy Spirit, that's a whole nother matter. That is as though that is the last straw. You reject the Father, you reject the Son. That's bad. That's very bad. But now when you reject the Holy Spirit as well, there is no place else to go. You've sinned against the Spirit. Uh, and the Spirit, you recall, is... Uh, identified as the Holy Spirit. And Scripture emphasizes the holiness of the Spirit of God. The Spirit is the one who applies the work of redemption to our hearts. He is the one who actually effects the washing away of sin and the cleansing of our hearts and minds and empowers us to live a new life. Um, these are the, the special works of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the one who sanctifies God's people. And so uh, the, the person of the Spirit is um, very, very focused on our holiness. And to say that the Spirit in His work in casting out demons, bringing healing to many, in uh, raising the dead, and giving us new life, sanctifying us, and preparing us for heaven to say that that work, and the Spirit also brings the truth of God's Word to us by revelation, to say that that Spirit, I hate even to conclude that sentence, um, that that Spirit is somehow uh, in any way related to Satan is just an offensive thing. And um, that is not forgiven in this life or in the next life. But the point that I would make with regard to the sin against the Holy Spirit is that it is something that is committed in this life and it may be a while while we live in this life before the full consequences of that come to us in terms of our death and final judgment. You know, there are some who say, well, perhaps the uh, sin against the Holy Spirit, the unforgivable sin, is a sin perhaps of committing suicide, uh, murder, adultery, things like that. But clearly, sins of murder and adultery may be forgiven. And it seems to me that uh, 
God is gracious towards those who might take their own life. Um, it's not my place to judge and make that final decision, of course, obviously. Uh, but I think the goodness of God, the grace of God is such that he understands that sometimes we get overwhelmed by our problems, our sin. We grow in despair. Uh, some folks are uniquely challenged in that way. Um, so I, I don't think that suicide is necessarily something that bars you from entrance into the kingdom of God. Uh, I, I don't think that. But um, what we're dealing with here is something of a different order. This blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, this saying that the Spirit is Satan, that's just an evil, evil thing. And that's not going to be forgiven. Um, if you get to that point where you uh, have reviewed the work of the Spirit and the inspiration of the Scriptures and the work of salvation and the rescue of the lost and bringing them to new life in Christ, uh, to review that kind of work and come to the judgment that this is an evil person, that is just an evil decision. And um, you'll bear the consequences of that. So I don't think that murder or adultery or uh, the, the unforgivable sins, I don't think that um, even uh, unbelief for a period of time, in this life at least, is unforgivable. Of course, um, if we fail to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will perish in that state of unbelief and there will be no forgiveness after that um, but I think what Jesus has in mind here is a specific sin that one consciously commits uh, and with, with which one experiences no trouble no questions or doubts about in its own mind um, there's a, a, a sin of that magnitude that is committed uh, that uh, may mark the balance of our lives in this life and certainly uh, in the life to come. So, um, you know, the Apostle John in his epistles uh, says that there is a sin that leads to death. And he says, I don't think you should pray for somebody who's committed that sin. And I wonder if this is not what he was thinking about, this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And uh, he says, don't even pray for these people. Don't waste your breath, in other words. Um, when they've gone that far in their uh, corruption and the hardness of their hearts, then there's no remedy for them. Um, so that's a very, very serious thing. Um, but I think that what Jesus has in mind here is that specific uh, sin against the Holy Spirit. And... You know, we, we see that kind of thing, it seems to me, in uh, some works in theology that review uh, the work of God in the Old Covenant, um, describing God as a demon, uh, of being a monster, uh, and, and destroying humans and all the rest of it, a God of vengeance and so forth. And uh, so there are those who take approaches uh, to the Bible and to uh, Christian faith and theology, which would suggest that there's a deep hostility, at the very least, towards the things of God, and perhaps even a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit uh, in the kinds of um, harsh judgments that are made uh, about God. So that's uh, the unforgivable sin. Um, the Christian will be preserved from such a sin uh, by the work of Christ and by the Spirit of God. Uh, God preserves his elect and keeps them from such a thing. And so um, we should be very careful to guard our hearts and our minds. Uh, but at the same time, the scriptures assure us that God's elect will be saved and therefore they will not commit that sin. Uh, God will spare you from that. And uh, so we rest on the mercies of God, the grace of God to preserve the children of God from evil and from sin. Uh, now uh, we'll, we'll turn to the, the next topic in Dr. Sproul's book. I think this is chapter 55 in the book. So we're actually only about halfway through the book. Uh, we've been making a good deal of progress along the way, but there's more to go.
Uh, and here the topic is syncretism. It might not be a word that you're very familiar with, uh, but it, it talks about the joining of uh, two evil things or two contrary things. Um, I took a look at a, a definition of that earlier today and, and tried to find the root words uh, for that. I, I know basically what, what they were. Uh, the first part of that word syncretism, S-Y-N, sin, is a word which in the Greek means together. And so it's a bringing together of two things. And uh, the uh, other Greek word, I think, is uh, kretos, um, which one translation was it meant a cretin. And if that's the case, then it, it reminds us of what Paul said to Titus with regard to the people of Crete. Uh, they were uh, liars and lazy beasts and gluttons. Uh, they were not very desirable people. In any case, syncretism is an effort to take two things which are fundamentally contradictory and to blend them together in such a way that you come up with a third thing. It's kind of like um, what Hegel used to teach in philosophy where you have a thesis, that is some proposition, some idea, and then it's opposite, an, an antithesis, antithesis, and antithesis. These two clash in history, in Hegel's view, and uh, or in philosophy. And the result is that when they clash, uh, they produce a synthesis. There's that sin together, thesis, idea. Uh, they, they come together and form a third thing. Uh, I believe it was Marx who took Hegel's philosophy and applied it to economics and saw the clash between um, uh, probably the, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat uh, and, and a clash which ultimately resulted in the what he described as the dictatorship of the proletariat uh, and, and movements toward a socialist Marxist economy. In any case, two things clash and come together. And you, you see that in, in the history of the church uh, as we go along from the old into the new covenant period of time where uh, there, the people of God have always been at risk of uh, uh, adopting other practices, the practices of uh, foreign gods, foreign uh, communities, and bringing them into their fellowship. Um, you know, on a human level, you recall that God forbid his people to marry foreign wives, those who did not share Israel's faith. And so there was uh, a, a, a concern for that because you were bringing in two diametrically opposite points of view, one of faith in the Lord and the other uh, a pagan uh, commitment to uh, false gods and uh, God did not want his people to enter into those kinds of relationships where uh, the, the uh, purity of their faith is uh, weakened and uh, there are consequences to their families over time. So uh, that on a human level, on, on a, a spiritual level, uh, Israel was tempted to go to the various uh, high places in the land where the Canaanites offered sacrifices to Baal or some of the other gods of that day and the, the temptation was to include these pagan faiths along with the worship of Yahweh so as to have your bases covered and uh, to be able to uh, buy the friendship of others pagans and work relationships and that kind of thing and so that syncretism was at work under the old covenant and of course the prophets spoke out mightily against that. Uh, you were certainly forbidden to abandon the worship of God, the true God, and to worship other gods, but you were also similarly forbidden to just add other gods, if you will, to your worship. Uh, God was a jealous God, and he wanted the complete uh, and full commitment of God's people to himself. And so you could not uh, blend um, Faith in God with faith in Baal, or Ashtarte, the, the uh, uh, kind of a, a, a sex goddess. Uh, so 
the uh, believers were to keep their faith pure from the incursions of the pagan world. And that continues throughout the history of the church. The, the pagan world is constantly trying to undermine and uproot and, and pollute the kingdom of God. These two are in constant conflict through the course of history. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. The kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Uh, and so you have the, the spirit of God as opposed to uh, the spirit of this age. You have Christ against Antichrist. Uh, it's this major historic uh, conflict over history and time where uh, the forces of evil uh, rooted in Satan, the prince of uh, of, of lies uh, seeks to undermine and destroy uh, God's work. Um, you have a, a very dramatic picture of that in the Apostle John's Apocalypse in Revelation chapter 12 where you have this image of a woman bearing a child and the dragon which was a symbolic representation of Satan himself um, waiting to devour the child, the child representative of Christ, and the mother being the, the church of the Old Covenant period of time. And so as soon as the Christ child is born and conducts his ministry, he's caught up into heaven and saved from the attack of Satan uh, in the form of the dragon. The dragon then is thrown down to the earth and he seeks to destroy uh, the, the women's children, the woman's children, that is the church, the New Covenant church. She is brought into the wilderness for a period of time, and there she is protected. But the dragon spews forth a flood. That's a flood of lies. It's the various um, false doctrines and false beliefs uh, that uh, inundate the church and uh, seek to destroy the church. And uh, in, in that interesting uh, imagery, John sees that the the earth helps the woman by absorbing these waters. So we are reminded that the, the heavens and the earth are organized by the word of God and the lies of Satan cannot stand in God's world. They eventually are contradicted and overcome by the uh, uh, irreversible, uh, irrefutable truths of God's creation and God's work of redemption. So... Uh, there is this constant effort of Satan on Satan's part to undermine the church. And the Old Covenant is with the pagan religious beliefs. When you get into the New Testament times, you see that Paul had to confront the influence of Judaism in the Christian church. You recall that as he wrote his letters to uh, the Galatians, in particular the Romans, uh, to um, uh, others as well, uh, he had to constantly fight against the notion that we need to observe the laws of Moses, and in particular the ritualistic part of that law, uh, in order to be saved. And so you had to be circumcised, you had to observe the feasts and the festivals, you had to do this or that, uh, 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 be careful about what foods you eat, and all these kinds of things. And so it was a, an attempt to undermine the gospel of grace, free grace whereby God saves us entirely by his grace and not by our works. And so Paul, in Galatians chapter 3, uh, chastises and rebukes the Galatians who were being tempted to follow along back into this Judaism. And he asks them, Who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? And so Paul raises the question, How is it? that you are being deceived like this, that you are accepting this uh, false works righteousness as some means of salvation. Uh, there is no hope in that system of religion. Your only hope is in Christ and in his work and God's free grace in forgiving you of your sins and saving you on the basis of the righteousness of Christ. And so that was the great fundamental conflict in, in Paul's day, uh, uh, particularly seen in Galatians and Romans, the books of Galatians and Romans. In fact, in Galatians, he is so strenuous about this that he says, if anyone preaches a gospel other than the one that uh, I have preached, let him be accursed. And so here uh, he, he pronounces an anathema, 
on those who would engage in syncretism within the church, blending Judaism with Christianity, accepting Jesus as a Messiah on the one hand, but on the other hand, still continuing to observe the law of Moses as an effort to win favor with God uh, through circumcision and uh, uh, cleansing rituals and dietary regulations, all these kinds of things. Paul says, no, none of that. All that is done away with under the Old Covenant. Jesus is the fulfillment of all those Old Testament types and shadows. We have in Christ all that we need. There's nothing else that we should look for, and so we need to stay with him. And so Paul had to uh, deal with the influence of Judaism within the early Christian community. And so that was from the old history of God's people where the, the Jews had departed from God's word of grace, which was actually revealed in the Old Covenant through Moses and David and the prophets and so forth. Uh, Paul had to uh, oppose the Judaizers, the, the, the Pharisees and so forth, who were contrary to the gospel. At the same time, there was a pagan influence as well that he had to fight off um, in the mystery religions that were at work in the world of his day, uh, and in particular, uh, uh, a pre-Gnostic form of belief that said that the body and things which were physical are evil, and that only the spirit is good, and you rise from this world uh, in spiritual means, through intellectual means, th through various rituals and uh, uh, mysteries uh, in order to find your way to God. And so Paul had to fight against that. In fact, Paul says in Colossians chapter 2 uh, to be on your guard against philosophies. It's not that Christian faith is opposed to the study of philosophy per se or that the Christian faith is unable to develop its own philosophy, uh, but Philosophy has a, uh, a way of undermining uh, faith in God and faith in his word. And so we need to be critical of pagan philosophy. That is, arguments that are based on a naturalistic assumption about the world uh, and not a, on the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God who rules over all things. So... Uh, there were battles on both sides for the church that Paul had to contend with, from the old Judaism on the one hand, and then the paganism on the other hand, from the, the Jewish community and the Gentile community. Uh, Paul had to fight against those kinds of things. So that is something that has continued in the Christian church, and I think some Christians get frustrated when their pastor <laughs> uh, points out the kinds of uh, wrongs, evil beliefs of different systems. So when your pastor talks to you about uh, such things as the dangers of Romanism, the Roman Catholic Church and its beliefs, or uh, liberalism, modernism, uh, these kinds of things, um, rather than getting upset that the pastor is speaking negatively about somebody, you should rejoice that you have a good shepherd who uses the sword of the Word of God to protect the sheep. Uh, Satan is attempting to destroy the flock of God, and pastors are called upon to feed the flock, but also to defend the flock from these kinds of things. And so, when you have in uh, the Roman church uh, very much what you had in the old Judaism, a, a, a reversion to a works righteousness religion uh, based on merit, think of the treasury of merit that uh, the papacy claims to have and uh, the good works that you can accumulate or you can have access to this treasury of myrrh to supplement any deficit in you or in a loved one. Uh, that whole system, that works righteousness system, is contrary to the grace of the gospel, just as Judaism was contrary to the grace of the gospel. It's the same thing, just with different, a different coloring, with a different... Uh, look to it, but at heart it's the same works righteousness that the gospel uh, is opposed to. And so uh, good pastors, sound pastors, will alert the church, alert the people of God to the influence of uh, uh, these uh, uh, contrary sets of beliefs and try to drive them away from the church, arguing against them. So 
Romanism and its various uh, uh, idolatries and wickednesses needs to be opposed. And at the same time, uh, modern uh, Protestantism, mainline Protestantism, also needs to be opposed. In fact, J. Gresham Machen in his book uh, Christianity and Liberalism, which I think I have right here, um, um, he, he uh, begins his book talking about the definition of liberalism and uh, he, he talks about the fact that, you know, some people think it's just a different version of Christianity, a different way of describing the Christian faith. And he says that uh, it's definitely not that. Um, he defines it as a completely different form of religion. Um, let me see. He says, the many varieties of modern liberal religion are rooted in naturalism. That is, in the denial of any entrance of the creative power of God in connection with the origin of Christianity. Um, so, uh, Machen properly takes a look at modern liberalism today, what you find in mainline Protestant churches, and says, this is not just a different variety of Christianity, but it's a uh, completely different religion altogether. Uh, it makes use of Christian language and Christian terms, talking about Jesus and uh, justice and these kinds of things. But it's an entirely different system based on naturalism, based on faith in man and what man can achieve on his own. And so when you begin to explore mainline Protestant faith, you see that the uh, death of Christ on the cross is not an atonement for sin, whereby Jesus pays the penalty for our sin so that we might be forgiven of sin, but rather it's the death of uh, one who loves his own, much like a fireman would rush into a burning house to rescue uh, a, a baby or a child, and in the process of rescuing uh, the one individual, he, his own life would have to be given up for that. Um, you know, the, the, the mainline Protestant really sees nothing much more in the death of Jesus than that, of a, a fireman going into a fire, or a soldier going into battle for his country, uh, laying down your life for others, a sacrifice of yourself for others. That's really what the work of Christ is reduced to, an example of love and commitment. Well, um, the Bible presents the death of Christ on fundamentally different terms. It's the, uh, the means by which our sin is punished and done away with through the, the satisfaction provided at the cross. Uh, it's through that death that our sins are uh, fully paid for. God being just cannot just simply excuse sin. Sin must be punished, and he does that in his Son, Jesus Christ, who stands for us. So uh, the mainline Protestant religious belief is a syncretistic faith, drawing in naturalism, uh, and you think of its support of uh, evolutionary thinking, uh, its support of uh, women's rights, gay rights, and these kinds of things where uh, the standards of God's Word are abandoned and uh, the uh, humanistic point of view is embraced uh, with the coloring of um, Christianity, uh, saying, quoting Jesus, saying, um, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And so they quote those kinds of phrases from Jesus, uh, abstracted completely from the, their context, and assign them to a pagan system of thinking and belief, and saying that Jesus would have been supportive of this development of uh, faith and morals in our modern world uh, based on those kinds of things. So syncretism is something that the church needs to be on its guard against. We need to submit our minds to the purity and truth of Scripture and have Scripture continually check our belief systems, our understanding of things, so that we can uh, be preserved from uh, pagan thinking. Um, so that's the great challenge that is there before us. Uh, we've considered these two different areas of uh, thinking, the um, sin, the unforgivable sin, and then the topic of syncretism. Um, 
the blending of uh, different points of view and making something uh, that is uh, kind of a third thing, um, bringing them together. Well, I hope that this is helpful for you and it, that it will help you to take a look at the scriptures in the Old Covenant and the New Testament and see them in a different light. In particular, see how there is this hostility among the prophets of God and the apostles in the New Testament, the hostility towards the incursions of pagan thinking, humanistic thinking into the church and uh, support a, a pastor who not only uh, speaks very kindly of everybody and is very encouraging and gives warm, funny messages that lift us up and inspire us, but look for a pastor who's willing to say that um, Romanism is wrong, uh, liberalism uh, is contrary to the gospel, and you need to repent of these things, that the social justice movement today, the progressive uh, movement today, uh, needs to be opposed. Uh, I'm not, of course, uh, opposed to true justice in the world, uh, but that justice needs to be defined by Scripture, by the Word of God, and not by what we think uh, makes for a just world. That's a topic for another day. I hope you will come to visit us at First Church. Uh, we are starting our worship services at a new time at 11 o'clock in the morning. So those of you who are slow to get up in the morning, now is your chance to come and visit us. And uh, those of you who have families too, especially, um, and it's hard to get a family up and running early in the morning, particularly with young kids. Uh, here's your opportunity uh, to come and enjoy the ministry of God's Word, uh, to have your children and your family disciplined by the Word of God and uh, be encouraged by that Word uh, and, and it'll be a great blessing to you and your family as you do that. Uh, we look forward to seeing you. The church is located on the corner of 5th and Ray Streets. It's undergoing some renovations at the moment. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, how the church is going to look. It'll look pretty good, really good, I think, uh, just after this weekend. Uh, but there's much more yet to come uh, in the um, months to come. Uh, there's more work that probably won't get done until next spring, so uh, there's more, more to come. Well, God bless, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Bye.